testament this, one of the other psychoacoustic things that really helps is your ear just cannot pick up on the same number of details uh, when you're playing polyphonically. In fact, I'm convinced that your ear picks up about the same amount of information no matter what you're hearing. And if it's polyphonic, you just get less per, per note playing. So it isn't this linear thing. If you're playing four or five notes at a time, uh, your ear isn't, yeah, it isn't as important uh, to, uh, to have as fast detail about each individual note. OK, so that's, that's the fast part of it. Um, and again, there's this real confusion in modern times now where we have communications that can go faster and faster uh, that uh, uh, about, oh, it's important to send all your sensor data. And that's totally crazy. If you actually figured out how much data that is on the continuum coming out, um, it, it's silly to do that. And it's also a, just a stupid approach because it means that the receiver has to filter through it and make some decision about what the heck am I going to do with all this data? And uh, you don't want to do that. So anytime, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, uh, always this push to make high-speed protocols so you can send all your data. And right now, I know from experience that most DOS can't keep up at full MIDI rate uh, because they do a lot of computation every time some MIDI comes in. Everything's optimized for this rare event, you know, MIDI stuff. Is, uh, uh, everything's optimized for sample generation. And so you're just killing the DAW by, by sending it uh, uh, too much data. Um, you're much better off than having the DAW reorder pitch bend messages for you or decide that pitch bend doesn't matter or whatever it ends up doing. Um, you're much, much, much better off having an intelligent decision made at the sender for what to send. So I'm actually, MIDI, yes, there are situations that you can come up with where MIDI isn't fast enough, but they're really tiny corner cases. And the vast majority of time, MIDI is fast enough and the stupidity going on. Uh, you know, I, I hear so many people complain that MIDI is slow. Well, they know that MIDI is slow, and it's true, it is pretty slow. Uh, so they hear a 20 millisecond delay and don't realize, well, there's 10 milliseconds for Ableton, and there's 10, another 10 milliseconds for another shell they've got, and another, you know, it just adds up from what you're doing. It's not, it's not actually MIDI slowness. You're hearing much worse slowness. I hear people using. Um, yes, so there's a lot of slowness out there, and people know that MIDI is slow, so it's always blamed for it. But actually, there's real advantages to not going crazy and just trying to send lots of data, even though I say it's paramount that things are fast. Um, it's also paramount that things are intelligently thin. Um, within the Egan matrix, I actually do, uh, I don't use all the data, it, it, it's done at a MIDI data rate, but yes, within internally, I use a higher MIDI data rate. Uh, but uh, we've done these experiments where you hook input to output um, and play it through MIDI after all the thinning and uh, yeah. Yeah, it's essentially like you're turning local off the con between the controller and the sound engine, and you just use you convert it to the baud rate of MIDI out yeah, and, and back and, in. Yeah, and then back in again. By the way, don't do that unless I tell you how to set it up um, because <laughs> it's really easy to record things. Uh, but but uh, uh, yes, uh, we can. Uh, 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 the new firmware, by the way, will look for MIDI feedback loops. It become a big problem. Um, I felt very clever. I made my input and my output to the continuum be very similar data. So like loading style, when you're talking to the Egan matrix, for instance, how it sends in the information is exactly the same way that presets are stored. So it receives information. Uh, so that's really great until you have feedback loops. Uh, then all sorts of interesting things happen. Uh, so, uh, oh well, <laughs> seemed good. Um, okay, so uh, the control loop is fast. Then. Also, the control loop needs to be sensitive. I just got done saying, ah, you know, you want seven bit pressures during the first uh, 20 to 40 milliseconds, but actually pressure goes to 14 bits or even more uh, during the sustain. So uh, this is something that a lot of people just don't realize how important, again, a control loop is. Um, a violinist can place their fingers on the fingerboard to about 15 microns of accuracy. 15, you know, you got this flag of finger, okay? 15 microns. Now, that seems just totally insane. Uh, but you can easily do the calculation. When you make beats melt away, uh, when you're playing a double stop on a violin, just do the calculation. You know how accurate and sense it has to be. You know how big the half steps are wherever you're playing on the fingerboard. It really is that. But it's because of the control loop, right? Nobody can put their fat, flabby finger on a finger, uh, anywhere to, to 15 micron accuracy. But what you can do is in a slow uh, control loop, if you play over several seconds, hey, uh, then you get that accuracy. Uh, and so, but that turns out to be very important. That, that's something that people in longer held notes uh, do regularly. And it's something that's just sort of lost in um, uh, modern setup. 
So, uh, so, the, so it has to be very sensitive, uh, especially over long term. And fortunately, with Hall Effect sensors, and actually many, but not all sensor technologies, it turns out that out of the Hall Effect sensor at any one time, I get a, uh, only about, uh, well, I have 12 bit converters, but I'm getting about maybe nine or 10 bits. But you know what? After reading a Hall Effect sensor millions of times, uh, because it has pretty well Gaussian distributed noise, you get much better accuracy. Uh, just from the law of averages. So it works, the sensor technology actually works into this, and I suspect your biological sensor technology is up there too, uh, doing a similar thing. But you get this super high accuracy um, because you're reading the same sensors over and over again. There's very slow changes. Uh, uh, the firmware and the continuum is smart enough to notice that and uh, to get you super high accuracy. If you doubt my uh, things on this, uh, we can do a demo someday. Uh, or sometime during this continue con and show you how that works. So it's not just for the pitch accuracy, right to left, it's also pressure. Like if, uh, if those of you who have been continuum players know about pressure weight of Portamento, uh, my, my best experience with that was at an NAM show. This person was new to the continuum. I always tell people, look, yeah, you can try it, see what it does, but what does that really mean? You know, would you walk up to Stradivarius and try it, see what it does? It, you know, it, it, it's actually sort of, condescending and insulting in its own way, but people don't know that because engineers work so hard to make everything easy that uh, that's not a familiar concept. But in any case, uh, uh, <laughs> there's always the exceptions. There's this person who came by the booth and um, and was playing for a long time, and actually Ed, or maybe it was Christoph, whoever was with me that could actually play was on break. So I just let him play because I, I don't play for people. I'm usually on break. Yeah, yeah. So, so, well, it's an am. It's so damn loud there. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so this guy, um, uh, th this guy was playing, and then eventually uh, he was doing this. He, he called a string over and stuff, and I could tell he was doing the pressure weight of Portamento, and he actually could play a melody with it, which I don't know if you could. Do. I can't. Yeah. Um, similarly, uh, I don't know if this is appropriate to tell. Maybe I don't think it's insulting. But uh, Jordan Rudis once sent me a bunch of MIDI files because he had had a problem with his continuum. And I told him, okay, play a quiet note, a medium note, a loud note, and do it three times in a row. And I, I forget even what the problem was. So he sends me this file, and sure enough, there's three quiet notes with the same, uh, you know, seven bit, the seven bit values the yeah. same. And then there was a, you know, medium, there was a lot. So the next time I visited him in New York, I told him, look, can you do this for real and like not edit your files? I mean, I, I realize you like perfection. And, you know, he looked at me kind of confused and was pretending like, oh, I don't edit my files. And, so he showed it to me, and sure enough, he did it again. <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't know what that is. Uh, so I, at that point, I could say it's actually accurate to seven minutes. I've told people over a short time it's only accurate to six. Um, I, um, some people can do that. <laughs> so yeah, that, that guy's pretty, uh, you know, uh, 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 there are many different styles of music. If the style of music isn't your favorite, ah, man, the skill level is just yeah. insane. Um, OK, so that's what sensitive means here, is that it, it, it's sensitive, especially over long term. And it has to feel right, too. It can't, you know, if a thing doesn't feel right, uh, it's very hard to squeeze that out of it. Organic, um, I will leave it to the E and matrix uh, discussions and stuff. The idea of organic here is, it, 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 I know, it's a without word. But um, uh, one thing that happened, for instance, Blizzard, uh, game company, for those of you who uh, don't know about games, they, they have several big games that use continuing very heavily, especially World of Warcraft and uh, Starcraft and uh, various other things. In fact, we once, uh, the guy at Blizzard once, uh, I'm not supposed to say his name, sorry, I, they have three composers and one of them does this. Um, on the website, this is his name. But in general, I was told in talks, I'm not supposed to say his name. But in any case, he, um, um, yeah, he told, he's computed once, of the classical style music that was heard around the world, what percentage of it is from Blizzard orchestras? And it's actually pretty high because you know this background music in those games is heard for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> uh, and and the, just the fact that they employ three orchestras tells you something. That doesn't include jazz groups. <coughs> but anyway, the continuum is not in with their synth groups. They have synth groups too. It doesn't fit there. It doesn't sound right. It's in with acoustic orchestras. Um, and uh, and it's similar, like if you listen to Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull or something, I couldn't even tell where the continuum was in all those things. I uh, your uh, friends with better ears that could tell all the spots. But yeah, it really melts in, and that's nice, but it's because it was controlled. It, it's just a different thing. Uh, this is not to say that MIDI keyboards are bad. I mean, one of the great things about MIDI keyboards is it frees you from all these details, right? I mean, there's all sorts of things you can do. 
And even exact timing and all these things. They have their own beauty, they have their own styles of music. That's all great. But in the acoustic world, uh, the difference is lesser, but you know, pianos and violins are very different, and it's just a stupid question to ask, is a piano better than a violin or worse? Uh, very different, they each have their advantage. But the huge thing about a piano is, well, those 12 note chords, good luck on the violin. You know, you're not gonna be able to do that. Uh, and, uh, and that's not to say that piano is just a note machine, it's a gorgeous instrument, but you, know, you can't do crescendos during notes. So then it's interesting, how do piano, pianists make up for that? But certainly piano is incredibly expressive, it's incredibly beautiful, and, and I don't know if a violin is more or less uh, expressive, uh, but it's, uh, it's a different thing. And the sad thing in the synthesizer world is that everything is gone, everything being very high percentage, uh, is gone to sampling and to automated stuff. And, and just, to, uh, just now I have email from a quite well-known artist who wants to rent one because he has a concert in three weeks. <laughs> and you know, if, like, I don't know, you know, if you had an orchestra and your soloist wanted to go rent a trumpet because they wanted to practice a little bit before the concert, because uh, they never played trumpet before, it's a uh, thing. So, and you know, it, we, no people don't know what to expect. So, if an audience hears it and it's it's somewhat lame, they may or may not know. Uh, similarly, they may hear fast and loud music like what Jordan Rudis does and does do not actually appreciate the skill level involved there because it's fast and loud and it's not everybody's thing. Uh, all right. So that's what that is. So the Egan matrix, just to say a quick thing about the Egan matrix, is there are many mappings of your finger X, Y, and Z position. Uh, so X, uh, sometimes in combination, sometimes not, sometimes linearly mapped, sometimes through uh, other mathematical operations. But within your synthesis algorithms, many of those synthesis algorithms are actually quite traditional algorithms. But uh, uh, the, the parameters are mapped uh, in, in you know, easily 20, 30 places uh, in different ways, in different combinations. And that, if it's a well-designed sound, can make for quite interesting play. Um, and it, it does have this problem that often the easier to play sounds are also in the end the ones that are actually somewhat less expressive and such. Uh, there's also this other problem that people know if they're imitative sounds, people know what they're listening for. And if they're not imitative, it's actually really hard to tell. <coughs> you don't know what you're listening to. So I've, I've convinced Ed uh, on a few occasions to be imitative things, and that's been uh, very helpful. All right. So that's, that's that intro, and how long do I have left? I... Half an hour? <laughs> Almost. Whoa. Well, I talked for 22 minutes. Yeah, okay. you're half done. Well, I, I, I wrote on my thing, no more than five minutes. So, uh, <laughs> no, no problem. That's why, that's why I gave you a 10 minute break after you talked. Yes, it was the five minutes, everybody. Well, and, and, and you can tell I teach at a university where the students are, you know, where they have to regurgitate what I say on the test. <laughs> And, uh, and I have to pay attention. Okay, so um, also for those of you who are new and also the much larger number of people who are actually watching this on the web, uh, I do this because it made a big impact at, at IRCOM, Continuum, uh, ContinuCon was there uh, in Paris and France last year. Um, uh, this is Hawken Audio World Headquarters. This is not a uh, fancy uh, place. In fact, it's also the neighborhood tornado shelter because I live in a swampy area at the farmer's home because he couldn't grow crops very well there. So of course he, he sold it to build houses there. Um, and uh, uh, mine was the only one uh, where that has a full basement, which turns out, in, in fact, the night before I left for con, uh, continue con on the other side of our block, a tornado did touch down, did a lot of destruction. Um, our beautiful place is, is uh, in good shape. Um, this is Dylan helping uh, <coughs> Uh, assemble uh, continue minis. In fact, he's doing so now as we speak. Um, uh, so yeah, it's a little hard to tell what's going on there, but there, that's Dylan. I also have Jordan working uh, for me, so I have some help with the assembly. Uh, with the continue mini, I wasn't, I just never did the computation. Man, well, how many hours will it actually take to do all this? Um, and there's me from a um, uh, Rob Schuller did a. Uh, Sojourn to uh, Champaign Urbana, and uh, he's been playing. We have a very, very nice concert hall there. Um, so uh, he comes once in a while, and he visited me there, and so he took that picture. So, um, yeah. The only damage we have recently is that this light fell out of the ceiling, but it was done. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, yes. So, uh, what have I done in the 37th year? It's a little hard to tell because actually a lot of changes happen over a longer time than that. Uh, but, you know, I tried to say, okay, what's really new that I couldn't have talked about at last ContinueCon? One of them things is this new enclosure. Uh, so, here is a new enclosure. 
I could pass this around, except it's not quite as light as a mini. Um, in any case, it looks a whole lot like the older enclosure. It turns out that it's slightly shorter because uh, the nice company in, in rural Canada, I went to, I have been producing everything in my hometown, but I could get a slightly better price and very nice quality um, in Canada uh, by a company in uh, uh, Cape Britain that's very rural Nova Scotia, uh, which is pretty rural to begin with. Um, but anyway, um, they, they do a beautiful job, um, but they had a, a length limitation. So one of the funny things about this is its length is slightly different. Don't worry, <coughs> you're in the same place. So you, you know, all your stands will work um, in your case. If you do get a new one, you have to um, make the case a little, uh, put a little bit more padding in the case, and I'll supply that. But anyway, um, yeah, so uh, that's the thing. Uh, what are some differences? Well, I have end plates on the end, uh, and uh, I had that actually at the very beginning, for those of you who have continuous before 2003, and then I got rid of them because of a variety of reasons. Well, they're back uh, in a better form now. The end plates are very nice for a variety of reasons. One of them is if I ever want to do a connector layout change, uh, I don't have to replace the whole thing. Uh, it's just huge. Um, and uh, there's also things, uh, the frame is quite stiff and quite tight, so to take off the bottom is, is a hassle on some of them if you've had to do that. Uh, please don't do it unless you get instructions from me. But um, if you uh, just loosen these screws, which are countersunk, then all of a sudden everything comes apart really nice and easy. So you just do one turn loosening. Uh, it has on the top, uh, maybe you can see it better in the picture, it's got a recessed, uh, uh, this picture is wavy, it, it's, it's because the screen's wavy. Um, but it has a recessed thing for the, um, uh, for the overlay strip, uh, just to make it look a little nicer. And uh, what else? Frame is super stiff, yes. So for the full size, I, uh, the frame was always quite stiff. It's angle, aluminum pieces are tightly put together, but on the full size, you can see I, I've got uh, two different ones here, but it's got these bridges built in to make it yet stronger. They make it a little bit more pain to assemble because they get in the way then, but, but it's very, very strong. Uh, so, uh, uh, but that way, did, yes. I'm sorry, but did you notice like there was some issue because of this, or was this just something you thought, I'll, I'll go one more step? There, there are, you know, I have uh, many different playing styles. Uh, I have a nice, nice video of somebody putting their full weight onto the continuum, uh, jumping up and down with their uh, fist on it. I mean, there, there's various ways to, to, to play it. Um, and uh, it just turns out that if you press hard enough, and even if you're just a very sensitive player, I don't know if you, you've ever played hard enough to do that, but if it moves even slightly, or it used to be if you put your hands on the edge and press down, right, you start hearing notes. Oh, yeah, yeah, that uh, happens. Do, yeah. do you have that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, see, that won't happen anymore. Okay. So, uh, well, you don't have to put your hands on the other side. I mean, but anyway. Um, but you have to press her pretty hard. Okay, well, it, it used to be really easy, and then it got pretty hard, which is what yeah. you got, and yeah. this is even harder. So yeah, so, so some minor changes. Um, are these huge? No. Would you even notice it? Uh, another thing will come up later slide, but uh, these two are actually very different in price. Uh, and we'll come up with this uh, in the later part of the talk. Um, uh, but from an audience point of view, like more than three inches away, uh, I think they look quite similar. So, uh, yeah. so we'll get to that in a little bit. Oh, oleophobic. Hey, that's a cool name. That, that Ed taught me. Um, uh, it means it doesn't show your fingerprints. It means I don't have to wear the white gloves as much when I pack things up. Um, but anyway, uh, one of these is oleophobic and the other one isn't. So uh, uh, that's kind of cool. But again, you don't see those fingerprints from the audience anyway. Uh, another thing that, that people won't even notice really, but for me it makes things uh, easier and better. And it's a step I've actually not gone to for a very long time because uh, I knew of some issues, uh, fortunately, for me, unfortunately for him, because he's enjoying it, my eldest son got a job at SpaceX and he just does analog circuits there and has figured out all sorts of stuff about grounding systems and has really helped me with, uh, with uh, uh, current sources and various other, you know, there's all sorts of tricks in this stuff that having learned textbook stuff from, from instructors at the university uh, uh, to learn other stuff is good. One of the things historically, there was this idea in design that you have an analog ground plane and a digital ground plane and they're only connected to one spot which is like the absolute worst way to design things that have high-speed uh, serial uh, mm -hmm. uh, or any high-speed di digital in them. Uh, because what happens uh, with these lines here, it's, it's hard to see in this picture, uh, even if you hold up a board, it's all pretty small, but you've got these uh, lines here that have um, 
ground in between them, but they're just long serial lines that go on to the next board. Most of them, some of them go to the ADE converter for this board. Um, the return ground on a high enough uh, frequency signal is immediately under the signal. And mm -hmm. it's not like you have to see a ground, which is you know, like you're used to an analog world where you've got a quiet ground and the whole world is nice and quiet. You've got the return is just uh, under that signal. And so if you are very careful with how you do your grounds, like on the other boards, the, the return path for all these signals was <coughs> around here and then back to there because I didn't have bridges in the right place. I had a lot of bridges, I just didn't do it right. And he looked at this and laughed and told me, hey, you know what, um, you get rid of that. So anyway, so I think that's, uh, uh, that was, that was uh, the straw that, uh, that got me to, uh, yes, uh, to redo that. So, so now it has a uh, more modern ground thing. It has some other improvements I've always wanted to make about better noise isolation stuff. There's this weird thing too, uh, I've been around too long and the analog multiplexers have gotten so good now that you have to worry about the uh, Pico um, uh, Coulombs of charge injection they, ha uh, they have and all these other things. So I, I learned some new things and uh, yeah. So, um, uh, oh yes, I, I listed on here since I said where, where things are assembled, uh, the boards are, the, all the boards I got are they're made in uh, Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Um, another thing I'm doing. Uh, is the, the uh, continuum E matrix expander. There's, there's an early version of it here. It was a rack mount model that was external um, that Ed has because he has lots of early stuff. Um, and it's fine. It's nice to have it external. There's some advantage to that actually. Like you can sell it separate from your continuum if you ever want to sell it. Um, if you have a rack, it's really actually sort of a nice connection point for other things. You know, there's some reasons to do it. But um, it, it became apparent that most people just wanted it built in. So now I build them into the continuums, and any recently sold continuums has mounts. If you look, uh, it's going to be too hard to see probably, but there's uh, screw mounts there uh, that are there just in case you ever want to get an expander. Uh, there's a place to put them. Um, but it's a hassle to, to install them uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, just because it's three times as many boards. It's got uh, connections between the boards all that. So um, it was historically a smart thing to do because it's exactly the same board as other boards I have. It was a baby step so that it didn't have like huge production stuff that, that cost lots more. Um, it also, because until very recently, I don't have replaceable plates on the frames. So uh, it made it so that uh, I could install it without having to replace the very expensive frame parts, um, which also is an enormous amount of work because you have to take everything apart. So you've got uh, uh, many, many, many uh, parts to reassemble. You know, it's probably, yeah, if it goes well, 12 hour job to replace uh, the bottom frame. So uh, really not exciting, uh, not fun. Um, so anyway, so this thing will be nicer. It does have a different connector layout, so it will only work for new plates. People that have the existing expanders uh, or the existing frame uh, enclosures can get the same thing, uh, not on one board. This mostly just makes it easy for me, saves me some money. Um, also it has SPDIF instead of AES3, that's just a connector difference. Uh, they're the same signaling. Uh, it turns out that's a convenience for some people. Um, <laughs> connector costs a whole lot less. You know, for me, it's smaller, so it fit. Um, it'll have a knob, so that's probably the only noticeable difference. This very early prototype is almost certainly not going to work just because the knob and the button are too close. But um, I, 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 w I had to get it done. I had too many things going on, and uh, realistically, there's always design changes anyway. So I just wanted to see uh, something work, and then uh, so this is just a prototype being made right now. Um, so the knob is nice. Uh, you could use it for, well, we'll see what people use it for, but initially maybe a volume knob because people have wanted some emergency off on their own stage. Um, or, or, or even just an adjustment for the levels. Um, so it's exactly equivalent to what you have uh, if you have an even matrix uh, expander built in, except for really minor things. One, for this thing, you don't need the uh, Roland UM1, and I buy those quantities. By the way, if you don't have one, you're a continuum owner, I, I have some in the car. Let me, let me give you one. Uh, I've had uh, quality control problems with all the other ones I've sold in the past. Mm -hmm. I've got literally boxes of hundreds of, well, I can't recycle them, but uh, I have boxes, I had boxes of hundreds of bad cables. Uh, there's a lot of this made in China problem where uh, Chinese do good work, but they have no way of testing anything. And things get sent directly to customers. So, you know, in some mega production run, it's all garbage, it all gets sent out, and then, yeah, there's no quality control. Uh, so that's a sad thing. I, I've gone to uh, any print circle ports I make, um, in, in this case here, they're here, but it has a test port. So at the manufacturing place that makes the board, they can test it. And 
actually tell that they're sending out good product. And it turns out every board house is just happy to do that for free because they actually like it more they're sending something good. Um, so anyway, so uh, uh, the Roland UM1, I've never seen a bad one. So uh, uh, I'll just give you one. But they cost me 39 bucks in quantity. They're even more expensive to go to the store. It's a lot for a USB MIDI interface. Um, but you get one that works. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, I, uh, I will gladly just give you one. You don't need to pay me for it. In the future, I'll save 39 bucks simply by uh, putting on my own board. Um, so advantages. Uh, you don't need the cable, but I give you cable anyway. That doesn't really matter. Uh, the knob might be nice. A disadvantage is those of you, of which there are several in the room, that insist on having more than two pedals at a time, it can't be. So with the current expander set up, yes, you can get up to four pedals. That's not even accounting for inflation. Yeah. 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 No, it, 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 it's strictly, uh, uh, I always get this uh, cute comment from people all over the world. Like even other people I met, like uh, my, uh, my neoprene manufacturer, because, well, you should set the, you know, the, uh, the price point lower and you'd have a lot more sales. Yeah. Uh, it's very tempting to, well, you know, if a real estate developer does that, like builds a million dollar house and sells it for 100,000, yeah, it would sell real fast. <laughs> uh, smart. Uh, but anyway, people don't know what's inside. They assume it's a piece of neoprene and uh, that's it. Okay, so, um, yeah, so it's always been, you know, I've always been trying not to increase the price. Uh, the price point, you know, the sales price is too low anyway in that there's not enough in it to share with, uh, uh, with a distributor. And the Continuum Mini, I was more careful with that. The Continuum Mini is a pain to assemble, but uh, the actual parts cost. It doesn't have any $700 components or anything like that. Uh, so uh, hmm. the actual parts cost is such that someday, uh, if I get the assembly uh, smooth enough and, and uh, people are skilled enough at it, it, you know, it's something where uh, there's actually, uh, it could be done through a distributor or such. Initially, I'm not going to do that because I'm not at that point yet. But the, the bare parts cost isn't so incredibly high. So rods, yes, I have these rods. So underneath the neoprene, which is on top of your continuum, in fact, I have some scrap if you wanted a party tonight, uh, ask me for it. Uh, lots of little scrap pieces. But underneath, underneath this neoprene, it's nylon on one side, uh, playing rubber on the other, are hundreds of these uh, precision machine rods, which you can't see, but I'll hold up. Um, they're actually quite wide, uh, and you can roll your finger to extreme accuracy, but that's because I use several rods uh, next to each other for measurements. Uh, they, these rods are mounted on piano wire springs, and then there's Hall effect sensors because there's magnets crimped in either end of the rod. So these rods actually uh, it took, me, it took me longer than I'd like to admit to figure out that those holes that those springs are in have to be very precision machined. I mean, like under a microscope, they're very smooth. And um, yeah, it's a princess and pea problem. Uh, the, your fingers just feel all sorts of stuff. Uh, so to really get it working, I, 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 uh, I had that. Now, more recently, I, I had not messed with the rods because there are core part of the continuum. Uh, they're quite expensive to machine, and they work. Uh, but it, it finally got to the point, I, I, I've been using aluminum nickel cobalt rods, which, uh, magnets, which were the best there were, uh, permanent magnets there were at the time I started. Um, and I switched to neodymium now. The neodymium magnets, uh, it's a little hard to tell unless you stare at these a lot. They're quite a bit smaller, it turns out, and um, uh, very strong uh, and very good and uh, very uniform. Um, and uh, because they're smaller, they, there's less crimping problems and all sorts of things. So basically, I'm, and the rod price now is the same for an assembled rod for me, is the same as it was eight years ago. So I sort of, eh, it wasn't a huge change, but it was enough uh, eight years ago. Um, if I don't have to do a price increase until eight years from now, that's great. So yeah, just for interest, the magnets are made in Pipersville and the rods in Toledo. Um, so these are the rods. Actually, I have many of these. If you would like a rod, take one. These are uh, 20, 000, uh, 20 mils, which for you European thinking people, yeah, it's metric, except it's metric inches. We're in a country where we sell like cable and kilo feet. We measure water depth in deci deci feet or tenths of feet. And okay. we do thousands of inches or mils. Okay. Uh, anyway, it's half a millimeter rod. But the holes aren't, are, are half a millimeter uh, off. Uh, so I can't use any of them. Uh, if you care, you can pass these around. It is kind of funny, now that you know what's in there, to then touch a continuum and uh, uh, you can convince yourself anyway that you feel them. And I think in some cases you really do feel them. But nobody walks up and says, oh, there's a bunch of screens and rods on these. <laughs> um, uh, that, that's something that, uh, yeah. Okay. That changed though. Early on, we used to have a thinner neoprene. 
and you could. Oh, we, well, they were actually, we didn't even have neoprene. Yeah. You were the one that suggested neoprene. Yeah. That's a great story. So here I am working my workbench in my basement. There's my old diving suits hung up above there that I don't use anymore. And like they're almost dangling in my face. In fact, I was thinking, gosh, you know, I've got to find these somewhere else for these because they're blocking the light. And then when we're talking, he says, well, you know, an ear cream might be a good material. And, you know, sort of reach it up and cut off one of them. And sure enough, uh, works pretty nice. Well, what did you use before the ear What do you call that cat house material? Yeah, it was just a fabric with a plastic backing. It was almost like the f first continuum I got had a, um, uh, almost like a, the sort of material you'd find inside a violin case. Okay. You know, it just... To it was it a problem because it was stretched in a frame. Yeah, kind of... And so you're pushing against the frame and, you know, it was bad. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that was after I'd already been at it for a long time. But, you know, in this continuum development, I mean, I, I actually tried this approach very early on. It was one of the first I tried, but it was too expensive. So then I tried all sorts of other things and eventually came back to it. Mm -hmm. no, at least it wasn't. So now, um, uh, the enclosures, uh, one of these enclosures here uh, costs $780, the other one costs $230. And uh, since you can't tell the difference from back there, I think that's really important because I don't want this to look like, oh, well, you're actually raising prices, you're just selling us crap. Uh, no, and actually the standard enclosure looks very much as the welded, um, the soldered corners and stuff like you're used to from the ones that were done in my hometown ones that everybody up here has. Um, uh, so the, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the much less expensive one is at the bottom, um, and the much more expensive one is at the top. Uh, they both have the recesses, they both have uh, uh, the plates, you know, all fun. they're meant to be identical. So what happened is I went from my uh, local town uh, uh, place to Cape Breton um, uh, to have them made there in Canada, in, in that rural Canada place. And um, they did a great job. It was slightly cheaper than my local place, but still, $780 is just a lot of money. Yeah. Um, and that's just for the frame. And that, there, there ain't nothing in it. Right? You know, that's just, that's like step zero. And uh, uh, so they do beautiful, beautiful work. And uh, for some people, you know, if you're going to buy a $5,000 item, you might as well spend 6000 and have it look really beautiful from close up. Um, but, you know, for me as a practical matter, it's just too much. So I gave in. This is the only thing that I uh, here uh, done in Hong Kong. But uh, uh, the less expensive frame it's done in Hong Kong actually costs one hundred ten dollars plus one hundred twenty shipping, and that's why. It's, uh, uh, yeah, you're you're welcome to look at these. Um, but yeah, in fact, I asked uh, somebody um, at um, at Sally's place, "Hey, which one is the high end one?" And he was saying that well, it's not really light, but uh, it's actually hard to tell. You really have to look at them really close. But uh, like if you want, like one of the places you can feel is like if you feel the recess here, oh, it's perfect. You feel the recess here, you certainly feel bumps. Uh, uh, so, so here, feel, feel, feel inside this here. But that won't show yeah, once yeah. you have the yeah. strip in. Uh, the strip might look a little on you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, basically you have little itty bitty blemishes. I'd say and, more beautiful works. Oh yeah, uh, but, but one is more beautiful. And Ed, Ed just said, well, I wouldn't want to play that. So, okay. Well, I didn't put it that way. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in any case, uh, uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, so we got both of them uh, from an audience, and uh, they look different. You have it on your hands all the time. And, the more, and uh, maybe not, this one just has it in the recess. But even in other places, the, the, the ones from China um, uh, have, like, little not rework place, but, but places where it just feels a little uneven. They work perfectly. There is no problem with them. Um, so that's why I offer both. So I have a standard and a premium. So uh, uh, so I say, yeah, prior, prior to 2018, they were all made in Champagne. Uh, now we got Cape Breton and uh, Hong Kong. Um, so the premium has oleophobic paint, uh, which so far nobody's really complained about, but it's kind of nice. Uh, uh, so that's nice if you like the paint. And the standard has more little blemishes. I have to say more there because any machine thing like this, there's always going to be something. But for instance, the, um, the, the much less expensive one will have screws where you can see that the screws aren't as good quality, like they have uh, uh, slight shininess to them. They're not really black uh, uh, the, 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 uh, because I, I, I require um, stainless screws and stainless black screws are made in different qualities and um, you know, the, the ones done in Canada are perfect. And you know, things like that. 
You are uh, a perfectionist by any chance, are you? Uh, well, I, I, I work with people that, that, that have these. Uh, them. So, so the, the difference in this cost here, yeah, both of these include shipping and stuff. I mean, this is very rural. Place. It's not quite as far away as Canada, uh, as China, but uh, it's very rural too. Um, uh, very far away, I mean. Um, but uh, They're more uh, set up for prototyping. Yeah, yeah they, like, they, this is this very rural place I figured out. Look, you know, we want a high-tech business and they're great to work with because, you know, it's a great thing in town. The other big thing in town is a very large fiddle. In fact, the largest fiddle statue in the world um, is there, I guess there's Canadian mountain fiddling or island fiddling or whatever. Okay, um, okay Breton fiddling is a very famous yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so they got that and they got this company, uh, but they just do beautiful, beautiful work. So they're called, in case anybody it has the cases made and, and would like to do it, they're price competitive too. They're not real cheap, but they're price competitive. Uh, protocase.com, and they have little programs where you can design yourself. Is everybody wants to do that? Don't do that. Just talk to the engineer. So, <laughs> um, so anyway, the standard enclosure has no price change. It actually, um, uh, because I've been eating my local cost, which was just over $700. Uh, uh, I, I mean, sorry, just over $700. And then did the Canada thing, but after our latest tariffs, because it turns out Canada is now one of the evil enemies, um, and, and those things, uh, the price has gone up now higher even than I had in town. I love the quality. Plus, I hate to punish them for, for problems that aren't really there. And they're doing all the mini cases. They're doing all the mini cases. Mini cases are much easier to ship, so I think that has a lot to do with it. Um, and they're also more what they do. They usually do electronic enclosures. The, the full size and now the half size to match is just a little bit shorter because it was the very largest enclosures they can make. Um, anyway, they're great. Uh, the people in Hong Kong are great too. You know, and if you think uh, trying to assemble something like that for two hundred ten dollars, uh, for hundred ten dollars, and then having more than half of the money go to FedEx, is, that's got to be frustrating. But anyway, um, uh, yeah. So, so good people everywhere in the world, um, and uh, you can choose by either because you'd like to support North American businesses in rural Canada, or you can uh, choose by by money. Uh, but they're the same otherwise, and, and so it, I'm just going to leave it up to people. Um, that's the nice thing about having a basement that floods. It's not useful for anything else. I keep everything off the floor a little bit. And uh, other than tornado shelter at washing machines and storage, that's all that's down there. I don't okay. think anyone's ever started with a sentence that says, the nice thing about having a basement that floods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> well, it would have been taken over by my kids, uh, who are now starting to leave the house. But, uh, OK, so uh, actually, what I'll do is turn on the light. Um, I'll get it for you. Oh, I I, I know which one it is. There we go. Um, so I got the Continue Mini, which is not really trying to make no price increase, but I'm well aware that uh, while I'm proud of keeping the price the same, it's still high price. Uh, people are a little bit confused. You know, every once in a while you get to, well, like Bob Moog made synthesizers accessible. Uh, look at those prices sometimes. <laughs> people saved up a lot <laughs> to, to buy those uh, uh, instruments. So this is a Continue Mini. The idea of it was, look, what can I do uh, that would be much less expensive components, which was actually a fun design challenge for me. It's hard to design things that cost less. You know, that thing, the fact that I have, uh, I don't know what, you know, connectors that, uh, just the connectors alone on there on the end plate, just the button cap on the end plate, 69 cents, where I found these buttons from Eastern European people at Superbooth, they cost eight cents. And they have the exact same longevity and everything. And they don't need a button cap. So anyway, that button cost me like $2.80 and you know, who cares? Well, uh, you can do it for eight cents. And, uh, and I also learned how you actually use these buttons so they don't break. Uh, you, you do have to build them into your frame and stuff. They're not, uh, one of the things that makes buttons expensive is that people can push sideways on the shaft. Uh, you gotta set up so that can't happen with these buttons. But if you do that, DigiKey, not, not some weird place, DigiKey, eight cents, pretty good deal. Um, so anyway, so I made these things uh, much less expensive and learned a lot from Superboos in Berlin. Uh, from our East German friends. I, they also have really cheap pine and they use a lot of pine instead of aluminum. Well, I didn't go that far. I, I did try plastic and spent too much. Uh, so I've been working on this for about two years, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, that's why there's been no new firmware release since 850. Uh, we're gonna try to fix that this summer. But in any case, um, uh, uh, it's uh, two aluminum pieces that are screwed against each other, so it's uh, uh, quite stiff for how heavy it is. Um, I'm going to open one up just to show it, I guess, but I should say here, you know, it's a lower price point. It's got uh, the Egan matrix in it, so that organic thing can happen with it. For you continuum players, it's super important that when you get one of these, realize 
I haven't talked to a continuum player yet that liked it right away. Hmm. I mean, it, you know, look, it's got four sensors, four elephant sensors instead of 512, and it's, yeah, you know, come on. Um, and, and it's a hybrid thing. It's got uh, a ribbon uh, and, and the Hall effect sensors and stuff. It, it's just not going to be the same experience. Uh, like I say here, it's much more like a Troutonium, like a modern Troutonium kind of idea. Um, but it's got these key ingredients, and if you look in the acoustic world, there's all sorts of different instruments. And some of them are, you know, D minus designs like a harp. You know, sometime thousands of years ago, some incompetent engineer designed this thing to pull at the soundboard in the wrong direction. So a harp is always ripping itself apart. But you know, thousands of years later, hey, you know, it really, really works. It's beautiful sound. And so, uh, so you got to rebuild it from from ground up every 15 years. Um, but uh, yeah, and you know, so there's designs like that in the acoustic world. There's also designs in the acoustic world where you have things like like French horn, where even world famous French horn players every once in a while blew up an entrance because it's so damn hard to play that thing. And in fact, there's I forget what their word for it is. It's like in pianists you talk about typewriters, you know, a piano that that always has is very even in, in dynamics and stuff. You know, people call, uh, and players that like those are you know are, are called typists. Um, uh, is that true? Is Rob here? What? Did he pass out? Is that true? Do you use that word typewriter or is that not in New York? Never used it. Yeah. And I was You never used it. Okay, well, anyway, so <laughs> in the Midwest, you know, you call a piano that has totally even um, uh, dynamics where every key you hit it, it responds the same. You call that a typewriter because the best piano will actually have variances in it. And uh, a very good performer practices on that piano the way it's going to be tuned for that concert and uh, really does it. Is, is that accurate to say? Or? Sure. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a nice guy. Uh, he, he won't embarrass me in front of a group. Anyway, that's what I believe I know about piano, which I don't play. Um, but, um, uh, yes, so in the acoustic world, there's all sorts of different instruments that all have their problems, have the extreme limitations, and are gorgeous. Okay, so in this thing here, uh, that's sort of the idea here. I promised I would open one up, so I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to be quiet. Um, uh, here, Ed. Open open. Oh, oh here's, here's actually something. The new ones have this touche thing. Ed has this nice uh, do-it-yourself video for putting a touche on here. Uh, we call it a touche. What is it really? Um, it turns out that this thing does front-to-back rocking. It's very hard to do it except sort of in parts of the thing. Uh, it's easier, you know, you get, for a few things, it's nice to have a second hand. We, we showed this at Superboost. Very few people played with it, you know. It, but it's an extra little thing. It's like being able to play Colegno, you know, with the wood of the bow or something. Uh, it, it's a nice feature that, that you can use. Another thing that's kind of funny about it is if you press <coughs> on this side uh, slightly, and one of my favorite pieces ever, the three pieces of string, um, on the continuum you use is two-handed, where um, X, Y, Z of the left finger only affects what he's doing with the right hand. Do slow crescendos that way, do all sorts of other things that way. Um, and you can do a similar thing here by pressing down here, and as long as you play in the upper two thirds, uh, you can do articulation from each note, but overall uh, dynamics from there, and similarly, all sorts of timbre changes and stuff. So, th so there's some use for it. Uh, another thing that Ed, uh, who is the touche instigator, um, oh, I, I only added it because it really cost, it cost the cost of the screw. Uh, you know, it didn't cost anything to do this. Um, so, so I figure out, ah, you know, instead of everybody having to do the DIY video. Um, he also found this great thing here. You can, I, I, when I first saw this, I said, oh my God. But um, yeah, you can just stick it right there into the, the that thing and uh, uh, that'll start. And wreck your mint. Um, and then, uh, dang. Okay, well, I can't get the screw. All my good tools are at home because um, I've got the minions working. I there. might be able to get at it. Uh, it doesn't matter. We're out of time anyway. Um, so I can explain what's in there. It's a plate. So if you're at all familiar with the Troutonium, the Troutonium plate is on a different hinging system, but it's a similar idea. Uh, then there's a ribbon on that plate. Uh, the ribbon is custom made because we wanted something lighter than the companies had. Um, and uh, there's a thin piece of neoprene over that. Because this plate has sides to it, you can press as hard as you want. In fact, at NAM, people were destroying a stand, like actually compressing the whole stand because you had to rebuild it a few times. Um, uh, and you know, it doesn't really hurt the mini, but I would say that that ribbon is a pretty sensitive ribbon. It's custom made to be uh, extra sensitive. I, I wouldn't beat the heck out of it. Um, uh, so yeah, so it's kind of good, I think, if you don't put your full body weight on it. You certainly gain nothing from it. So, um, but it, it should survive that. They survive trade shows and such, so they can do that. Um, then, uh, yes, it, it senses quickly. It has an Egan matrix in it. And because of that, there's, it, it's much more, uh, 
quirky what you can do with it and what works well with it. But as I say, all the continuum owners that I have that gave it a chance, two of them just sold it because other people wanted it real bad. That's fine. Um, but uh, all the ones that have given it a chance actually play it once in a while because they actually enjoy it. In fact, you'll hear talks today that are using a mini for no reason except that it was easy to carry. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, is it the same as a continuum? Well, <coughs> absolutely not. You'll hear talks today too that, that tell you that. But it, it's a very nice companion. Is it better or worse? Well, in some sense it's worse, it's more limited, but there's certainly things you can play on this that you'd be, uh, is that true? Be challenged to play in a continuum? <laughs> um, yeah, well there's also the aspect of, in, in the just physically, <coughs> in the ergonomics of a studio. I can okay, have that so right said in no. the So it is anything that you can play, uh, but you know, but still, there's a lot to do with it. Um, no, there are, are things you can play on that that you can't. sometime? I will have to, to uh, on Saturday. I'm sorry. Okay. 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 Well, anyway, I will shut up now. I'll leave it on. Oh. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah.